Darling in the Franks was a big deal. It took the internet by storm when it released in 2018, an original anime made in collaboration between two giants in the industry, A1 and Trigger, but it was the latter that everyone was so crazy about. A1 was cool, but Trigger was different. It was the studio that had produced some of the most influential anime of all time that are not only respected classics, but iconic shows that helped shape and define the medium of anime itself. Now imagine hearing that studio Trigger, nearly 20 years after their predecessor's last iconic show, was producing a brand new original mecha anime with the eccentric experimental style of Trigger, but the groundedness of A1 and you can begin to see why Darling in the Franks was a big deal to people. This paired with Tharlifa's extremely promising season 1 and a certain pink haired dinosaur girl that would explode into popular anime culture, everyone was talking about this show. Yeguk made like 8 videos on it, Kim Kardashian tweeted about it, and Animemes is still making zero two memes. It's been 5 years. This was the anime that would return mecha to its former glory. An anime that would not only define the mecha genre in the sea of modern anime, but leave its mark on the medium for years to come, cementing itself as a new modern classic. But now, if you're watching this video in 2023, it's pretty obvious that that didn't happen. Now, nearly 5 years after its finish, the show that took the anime fandom by storm is all but forgotten, the only remnants of its impact being the aforementioned pink dinosaur girl, an empty, soulless husk of her former self, commodified into an overused meme, reduced to a TikTok dance. No, no, no. -uh. While everyone else seemingly moved on, I, much like r slash animemes, never could. But how could I? Darlifra was the first seasonal anime that I ever got to experience live. I felt a lot watching this show. So what happened? What was so special about it? And was it even good? Or has my history with anime been a lie? A fabrication of the stupid, goofy mind of my 15 year old self. I needed to find out the truth. And to do that, I'd like to do something that I rarely do on this channel. I'd like to watch the- The setting of Darling in the Franks is that of a futuristic, post-apocalyptic world where giant biomechanical monsters called the Klaxosaurs have driven humanity off of the Earth's surface, cramping them into these mobile mechanical monoliths called the Plantations. And as you can probably guess, it's up to none other than these teenagers to risk their lives and pilot the giant robots. Classic trigger. And it's here we find our protagonist, Darling. Oh, someone already made that joke? Shit. Who, unlike the other teenagers that are called parasites in this world, can't pilot the robot. That is, until he meets Zero Two, the half Klaxosaur ace pilot, who also has a reputation of killing every partner she rides with. Hero finding out that he's the exception and that he can awaken Strelitzia's true power, and that's episode one. And okay, that's pretty cool, albeit maybe a little generic for a mecha anime, and that seemed to be the people's general consensus about the first episode too. So what was it about Darling in the Franks that captured so many people's attention? And the answer to that, lies in its characters. It's easy to brush over the characters of Franks at the start. Their designs aren't exactly the most striking, their personalities feel more like singular tropes than an actual person, and for the lack of a better word, a lot of them just exist in the background like NPCs. Take this character for example, and what information can you glean about her just from looking at her? Well, not much. Maybe you can tell from her hair and face that she's kind? Maybe she's the more mature big sister figure of the group, but that's about it. Her grey uniform doesn't tell us much about her personality, she doesn't act in any ways that stand out, and the same could be said for pretty much every character we're introduced to in the first episode. But now, take everything I just told you about those designs, bland, generic, plastic, and flip it on its head, and that's zero two. Chances are, even if you haven't seen Franks, you've seen Zero Two. With her iconic horns and instantly recognizable pink hair, Zero Two is the wild, unpredictable, and rebellious ace pilot that we meet at the start of the show. 
but watch how this single foreign variable begins to change the dynamics that exist between the characters of Squad 13, starting with a trio of childhood friends, Hiro, Goro, and Ichigo. Zero Two now inserting herself into the love triangle between them, making Ichigo, who is the usually composed squad leader, into acting more assertive towards Hiro, while Goro, the big brother of the group that holds the team together, struggles as his loyalty to both Hiro and Ichigo as their friends stops him from acting on his feelings. This is a drama that doesn't get resolved until episode 14, and don't worry, we'll talk about episode 14. But for now, it's these sorts of messy and broken relationships that you start to see form between every major character in Squad 13. Like Mitsuru, who, when you first meet him, is kind of an asshole for the sake of being an asshole. But you watch him as he grows out of that edgelord personality, from developing a love towards Kokoro, who is actually Futoshi's partner, and see how that affects Futoshi. Or Ikuno, coming to terms with the fact that she'll always have trouble connecting to her male partner because she loves Ichigo. Or Kokoro and this book she finds on the beach, which honestly is a subject I have no idea how to approach nor fit into this video, so I just won't even attempt to talk about it. That and also, this video is already way too long and any more parts just might turn me into an insane person. And finally, Miku and Zorome, who actually, they don't have that much drama but I love my two tsundere's all the same. All of this resulting in this web of connections, wide enough to be documented and updated every episode by the community, or this one made by Gigguk. And slowly, what all of this culminates into is a story that takes you on a journey of a group of deeply flawed people learning what it means to be human through the relationships they forge with each other. By themselves, they feel static, but through their interactions with other people, they begin to feel human. And what I love about Darling in the Franks' fights is that they're an extension of that idea. But to explain what I mean by that, we first have to understand how these giant robots in Darling in the Franks work. And to do that, we first have to talk about sex metaphors. Oh god, what am I doing with my life? If Evangelion has the Ava and Gurun Lagan has the well, Lagon, Darling in the Franks has the Franks. That rolled off the tongue a lot better in my head. But unlike the giant robots of other mecha anime, the Franks is piloted in pairs of two parasites, the male stamen and the female pistol. Look, I know Gurren Lagon also technically has two people piloting it, but that's two robots on top of each other, so it doesn't count, okay? And if you disagree, I don't care, and you're wrong! And what makes this partner system so interesting is that it's not the individual pilot's skills that determine how well they can fight, but rather the trust between the partners, having a direct influence on how well they could pilot the robot. And on paper, that's a pretty cool idea, but it's in their portrayal of that idea where things start to go very wrong. And if you want to know what I mean by that, why is she positioned like that? Why do they have handlebars on their asses? I don't like those words they're using. Okay, come on, really? Before I go on any further, I feel like I should get this out of the way first. If you've ever seen a trigger show before, you probably know the deal. This show is not gonna be for everyone. A plot like Moe Robots being piloted by pairs of teenagers in sus positions through sex analogies is weird. And even for trigger standards, while the not so subtle euphemisms were something that didn't bother me 5 years ago, now as a 20 year old man making videos about anime on the internet, it is something I cannot go without acknowledging. To the point where, about 3 episodes into re-watching the show, I began to have a mild crisis about whether this video was even a good idea in the first place. Like, was Darling in the Franks ever good? Or did I gaslight myself into thinking that what I watched was good for all those years? But luckily, if sex jokes were all there was to this weird, weird show, this video wouldn't exist. And while I won't try to justify it or try to tell you that the robots with massive asses are actually super deep, what it does is make one thing clear. This is not a show about the giant robots fighting, rather what you're in for is a human drama about Squad 13 and the relationships that are formed, tested, 
broken and rebuilt between them throughout the course of the story. The double pilots cementing the idea that this is not a story about any single character's goals or motives. It's about all of them and the relationships that exist in between. And damn, I never realized the high school drama in the setting of a mecha is something I needed, but here we are. And once you begin to care, it's hard not to get attached. Which is what makes an episode like episode 8 hit so damn hard. Squad 13 is engaged in battle with yet another Lovecraftian nightmarish beast. But through their efforts, 13 has started to become a competent team by now. So one by one, they carefully coordinate their attacks and starts to win. And what happens next is honestly, truly terrifying. Dinosaur Acid has melted through the pistol suits. So the boys are like, they kill the Klaxosaur, the day is saved, whatever. It's a little annoying, but I guess it's nothing we're not used to at this point. But what I didn't expect to happen was for the show to turn this goofy ass fanservice scene into a plot point that leads to a war between the boys and the girls. Because whereas this sort of thing would have usually been brushed off and forgotten about the next minute in most anime, our girls get rightfully pissed. And it's silly, but it's also funny. It's hard not to remember yourself being there at one point. That's how teenagers act. They get into stupid fights and do petty things. Then we get this scene of Zero Two where she says this. And look, the characters I was comparing to background NPCs 5 minutes ago are starting to feel like a real family now, and their relationships are starting to change Zero Two too. And you think a slice of life episode in a dystopian anime about child soldiers shouldn't work, but it does, and it's just fun. Which is why it's so jarring when the group enters a barred off room and they find this picture. It's the parasites that used to live in the plantation before them, who were all killed in combat by the Klaxosaurs. And that's insane! 13 enters this episode with dinosaur acid, but comes out of it with the realization that if they want to survive in this world, they'll have to learn to understand and live with each other, despite their differences. The boys apologizing to the girls, and the girls learning to forgive them. And wow, this episode went from starting with fanservice, to having one of the most deep and real messages about human relationships and just being alive, and it's this aspect of Darling in the Franks I love most. The action is great, but the fights feel like an extension of the emotions our characters are experiencing, the battlefield being a physical representation of that drama. But now, take into consideration everything I just told you about this group of deeply flawed yet human characters, and compare them to the adults whose cold, looming presence we felt throughout the entire show. Imagine living in a world where you are free from all the stress and worries of life. All of your basic needs like housing and food provided for you so you don't need to work anymore. Actually, you receive all the nutrients your body needs in packets, you do not need to eat anymore. Your weak and finite heart was replaced by something cold and mechanical. You can no longer die. Hell, you don't even need to do the things that used to make you feel happy anymore because there's a machine that can make you feel the same thing by stimulating the same parts of your brain. And because you've become entirely self-sufficient, as all of the hierarchies of your needs are provided to you by a machine, survival, security, happiness, you no longer have the need for human contact. You simply exist. And to ape, that's the pinnacle of human evolution. So while the children's journeys have been about learning to embrace their humanity, along with all the love, joy, pain, and hurt that comes along with it, the adults are a cold and utter rejection of that very same humanity, instead having replaced their lives with a cold and perfect machine-like existence of eternal sameness. And if you thought that dystopian nightmare city or the brain happiness device I just described to you was interesting and 
well, terrifying, it's those sorts of revelations, tidbits of lore and world building that are scattered throughout the first 15 episodes of Darling in the Franks, bringing me to the next aspect of the show I think it does great, the world building. Take the ominous looming threat of Ape, this creepy council, or Papa, the big brother of the world of Darlifra that monitors your every movement and punishes you for getting out of line. Or questions like the origin of the Klaxosaurs, the remnants of a past civilization, what exactly forced humans to go into the plantations in the first place, and where the children even come from. These are all topics that were never outright told about, but ones we can see through the world our characters live in as a result of their actions. But here's where that starts to become a problem. Where a Squad 13 story has been characterized by their friendship, love, and learning what it means to be human, nearly every aspect of the world around them is characterized by the opposite of that. The complete lack of any human emotion or empathy. And that very same humanity that 13 spends all that time finding, the same love that breaks and binds them together, the hopes and dreams that make their unfair existence bearable, is viewed as nothing more than a defect to ape, the real antagonists of Darling in the Franks, Squad 13's growing humanity, seen as nothing more than a weakness to be straightened, an imperfection to be snuffed out. And for as wholesome, weird, and silly as Darling in the Franks can be, we've also felt their presence since the start of the show. Be it from their monochrome uniforms, birdcage-like house, or in the ways their lives are treated like they're expendable, we're reminded again and again that whatever semblance of happiness Squad 13 builds for themselves is temporary, and it could be taken away at any moment. And it's this conflict of ideas that carry us into what many consider to be the best arc of Darling in the Franks, starting with a flashback between the two central protagonists of the story, Hero and Zero 2. Hey, so what I'm about to describe to you is what is, in my opinion, the single greatest episode of Darling in the Franks, and one that probably led to the creation of this video in the first place. But what that also means is that what we're about to get into is pretty much going to spoil the entire show for you. If you've made it this far into the video, I doubt you'd really care about that, but I thought I'd let you know anyways. And well, I hope I do a good job in conveying to you the impact of this next arc. Enjoy. Throughout the story of Darlifra, we've seen the theme of becoming human reinforced again and again through the characters of Squad 13 in their own ways, whether it's through Mitsuru's love or Zoromei's acceptance. But perhaps the most literal embodiment of that is Zero Two, the half Klaxosaur ace pilot who was born in a lab for the sole purpose of becoming a weapon. Her desire to become fully human stemming from a promise she made with a certain boy from her childhood, and it's this desire we see grow into desperation as we approach the halfway point of the show, a desperation that builds as we see Zero Two grow more and more unstable, becoming the monster everyone saw her as, and we begin to question who this starling exactly is, which is something that gets revealed as we enter episode 13. Starting with a flashback. Created in a lab with the DNA of a Klaxosaur to become the perfect pilot, Zero Two was chained, tortured, and experimented on as a child, her earliest memories being that of her locked up in a small room, and that being her entire world. This only changing for the first time when her caretaker gives her a picture book, her first pretty thing. And for a while, this is the only thing that humanizes her, or gives her any sort of semblance of being treated like a person, so she holds onto this book for dear life, becoming her sole lifeline in her hellish existence. That is until he crashes into her world, reaching out his hands to her as a shining ray of light blinds her, going as far as to defy Papa to offer this little monster an escape, showing her the outside world and letting her experience what it's like to be loved for the first time in her life. And it's not too difficult to guess who that boy is. That boy is Hero, her darling, whose memories had been erased until now, the memories of his childhood now flooding back into his mind, as we get one of the most beautiful ending songs I've ever heard in anime play over this scene. You 
and wow, I cried when I watched this for the first time. The emotion and execution of this episode feeling like the payoff to everything we've been watching up until this point, and this, for me and many other people, was the point in the story that solidified this show as one of Trigger's best works. Episode 13 is freaking awesome, but that also meant that Trigger, in a weekly release schedule, had a lot to live up to in the next episode, and when it eventually arrived, episode 14 broke the internet. But unfortunately, not in the way you may be thinking. For many people, episode 13 was the peak of a ride they had fully committed to at this point, and for the same reasons I've been talking about for the past 20 minutes, this is a show that elicits a lot of emotion in people, the episode we just witnessed only reinforcing that. So when that big payoff everyone was expecting after last week's emotional roller coaster doesn't happen in the next episode, it broke the community. Because immediately after the events of the emotional high we just witnessed, episode 14 is about Ichigo doing everything in her power to prevent Zero Two and Hiro from ever meeting again. Hiro now hospitalized as the aftermath of Zero Two's rampage. And this caused a shitstorm online unlike any I'd witnessed before. The community going on this Ichigo witch hunt, getting so bad to the point where members of the staff were starting to get harassed by angry anime fans on Twitter. And look, I've got my fair share of criticisms for this episode, but no matter how disappointed you may be in a piece of media, that sort of shit is never okay and shouldn't be tolerated under any circumstances. But that isn't to say I don't have my fair share of criticisms of this episode. Up until this point, the drama and conflicts that drove the story of Darling in the Franks have been characterized by just how raw and human it can feel, and as messy as they can be, they also felt like the natural outcome of the environment and circumstances our characters are in. But episode 14 felt like the opposite of that. The entire conflict happening because Hiro happens to leave his room at the exact same time Zero Two happens to visit him, leading to this frustrating contrived writing that soured the emotional high of episode 13 for a lot of people. Or so we thought. Because the episode that would follow the Ichigo complex would redeem everything I just talked about. Coming back from the intense community lashback to become what is the single greatest episode of the show that broke the internet. Episode 15, titled The Jian, is the part of the story when our characters finally enter the Grand Crevasse, home of the Klaxosaurs and the biggest battle Squad 13 would face yet. But because of what happened in the previous episode, their strongest fighter, Strelitzia, is missing. Zero Two now piloting the robot by herself in rampage mode, growing more and more feral with each kill. And it's devastating, ape sacrificing countless Frankses and even self-destructing plantations to create openings into this nightmarish fortress, only to be met with the massive Gutenberg-class Klaxosaur penetrating the walls of 13's plantations as hordes of monsters flood into the city. Zero Two's state only worsening as she's become this unrecognizable feral beast, having let herself go and resigning herself to the fate of being alone forever. But finally, the one thing we'd all been waiting for begins to happen before our very eyes as Hero charges into the battlefield in the tiny training unit, running towards Zero Two with everything he's got. All of his memories with the girl that changed his life now flashing before his eyes. And yes, it's finally happening! As Goro realizes he doesn't want to see his friends split up anymore, and Ichigo accepting the fact that Hero had chosen Zero Two over her. The trio reuniting one more time as the friendships he'd forged throughout his journey now pulls him out of his lowest point to reach his darling. And then this happens. And yes, this was it! All of the sex jokes, the drama, the misunderstandings, the backstory, it was all leading up to this one moment and this scene made it all worth it. And this explosive climax as you hear the opening song over the animation and it's beautiful. Putting a close to the first major storyline of Darling in the Franks, the story of Hero and Zero Two. 
Episodes 13 and 15 are a goddamn masterpiece, and I can't think of any other word to describe what I felt experiencing it for the first time. To the point where I could almost say that this might as well have been the crucial turning point of my life that made me fall in love with anime, leading to the terrifying butterfly effect of me turning out to be an anituber. That only being almost because Jojo exists. My point being, this is a show that makes you become emotionally attached, and I wasn't alone in this. This being the episode that solidified the show as a serious contender for anime of the year for many people. Which is why it pains me to say that the rest of Darling in the Franks were a goddamn mistake! The episodes leading up to the fall feel strangely beautiful, like we're watching the creators of the show giving their beloved characters one final send-off, saying goodbye to the way things were, but also embracing whatever awaited in front of them with hopeful optimism. As the cast prepare to say their last goodbyes to their old home, now destroyed as an aftermath of the Battle of Grand Crevas, they hold a wedding for Mitsuru and Kokoro, who have now entered a romantic relationship. And damn, I wasn't expecting them to get back to the Slice of Life episode so soon, but it's nice. Like, we were watching the aftermath of the absolute peak of Darling in the Franks, in both storytelling and popularity, a sort of epilogue to the first chapter of Darlifra's story. Which is why it's so devastating when the wedding is suddenly interrupted by the adults, Mitsuru and Kokoro taken, their memories erased, their happiness dashed away by Ape yet again. And it's devastating to have watched a character grow from being this asshole to one of my favorite and most endearing characters in the show, then having all of that taken away in an instant. Any sort of happiness, hopes, or dreams the children of Squad 13 have, crushed by Ape in the adults' cold, unempathetic control. And the cast feels this too. They've been feeling it all along, but this would be the final straw. At last, Hero and friends, now with the power of the Awakened Strelitzia, would rise up against Ape, fight for their freedom, and carve out a brand new world for themselves in one final epic battle for their future, leading into the last arc that would end the show in an epic finale. And then this happens. What did we just watch? Aliens invade the Earth, the Claxosaurs turn into rockets and fly into orbit, anti-space railguns start blasting at an alien space fleet, there's a giant robot now, and Ape turns into... whatever this is. The show explains this to you. Because actually, the Claxosaurs were the good guys, that actually used to be an ancient species of people called the Claxosapiens, that actually buried themselves underground to defend the Earth against Ape, who are actually called Verm now, who are an alien species that wants to kill everybody and suck their souls into the hive mind. And now you're caught up to the last arc. If any of what I just said made absolutely no sense to you, that means I did a pretty good job at summarizing it. And now the show expects you to be on board with this. Did I mention all of this happens in two episodes? And now they're in space. Because now, the aliens are trying to blow up the planet, but actually, what they're really after is this giant robot called Star Entity, and now there's a Klaxosaur princess, and okay, sure, why not? They have a rocket ship now, and fuck it, let's turn Zero Two into a giant robot, we're watching a different show now. What happened to the subtle world building, the character driven plot, everything we've loved about this show for 19 whole episodes gets thrown out the window and launched into the sun, the show ending in a space war, there's no foreshadowing build up or anything that even hinted at the existence of an alien empire and oh my god this is like the fourth time darling in the franks broke the internet we've literally been through the five stages of grief with this show why what happened trigger what were you cooking why is this what you made hopefully by this point in the video i've done a good enough job in conveying to you the dilemma i'm facing with this anime on one hand, darling in the franks is this beautiful story about love relationships and just being human, but 
On the other hand, it's like a train wreck I can't look away from, crashing headfirst into a wall of problems like poor writing decisions, batshit insane pacing, and not knowing what it wants to be. The end result being this joke of a show that went from being one of the best of the year to the community's laughingstock. So is Darling in the Franks a masterpiece? Or is it complete garbage? Or maybe it's neither, but I can't just call it mid, this show changed my life. So what is Starling in the Franks? And to me, I think the answer to that question lies beyond the show in the director of Starling in the Franks, Atsushi Nishigori. I used to work at Gainax, and a lot of my peers moved to Trigger while I was working on Idolmaster. Now I'm nearing 40, most of my coworkers are moving up and directing their own shows, so I felt like this might be one of my last few chances to gather my favorite staff members and create something together. What I just read to you is a quote from an interview about Darling in the Franks by the director of the show, Atsushi Nishigori. And while it's true that Darlifra was created as a collaboration between A1 and Trigger, one thing I didn't mention is that Darling in the Franks is just as much of an A1 and Trigger show as it is Nishigori's creative vision. An industry veteran and former member of Studio Gainax, behind some of their most iconic works, including the titles I mentioned in the intro, Grun Lagan and Ava to an extent. A man, despite his experience in the industry, who had a dream of getting to direct his very own show. A dream that only seemed less and less likely as he took on the safe and stable job of directing the Idol Masters, shows and movies. And when he finally got that chance, decided to do it with his favorite people to work with, his old friends in the industry. People he'd worked with before and people he knew the talents of. And when you look at Darling in the Franks with that new context, it's impossible not to see it in every corner of it. The show's mecha and slice of life aspects being a result of blending his colleagues' individual strengths, having worked with all of them before. And in this interview, he makes the message of his show pretty clear. <laughs> And despite all of the batshit insane plot developments, I think you can still see this message shine through in the show's last episodes, embodied really beautifully in this quote by Goro. Everything changes, all things eventually pass, and nothing remains stagnant. But if that nature of our world scares you out of appreciating what you have now, you will never grasp any kind of future for yourself. And fuck, I think that's beautiful. As stressful as making these videos can be, creating this YouTube channel was also one of the greatest decisions I've ever made in my life. And while it would be silly to say that this anime was the sole reason behind it, it still holds a place in my heart as one of the first anime I ever got to experience. Showing me the absolute highs and lowest lows of what an anime can be, and also introducing me to some of my favorite genres in the medium now, being mecha, slice of life and romance. And whatever it is Nishigori was looking for with this show, I really hope he got it. Because Super Eyepatch Wolf, who this video is undoubtedly inspired by, once said that spectacular failures have more value than mediocre successes. And while Darling in the Franks may be far from a masterpiece, it may as well be the most spectacular failure of all time. And that's how Darling in the Franks broke the internet. So if after all that, you're still wondering if you should watch Darling in the Franks, just watch Gurun Lagan.